cómodo yo vale gracias Thank you. 
And after that, we will have a super short break for the ones who would like to stretch their legs or maybe leave and not listening to the rest of the defense. And after that, we continue with questions from the committee, from Janine Hack, from David Sanchez, and then from myself. And then finally, there is also a chance for anyone who is a PhD in the room here to ask questions if they want. After that, we close the public part of this and the committee gathers and then discusses the grading of the thesis. So that's how it goes. So I give the word to the defendant, please. Thank you. So this is the defense of my PhD thesis, supervised by Rosa Lopez. And the title is Heat and Charge Transport in Nanostructures, Interference, AC Driving, Environment, and Feedback. And I hope that by the end of this talk, this is clearer what it means. So first of all, we'll start with a short introduction of the systems and the effects that are most important in this thesis. And then we'll, we will move to the results chapters, the four chapters of results. And then we will see which uh, are these results. And then finally, some conclusions and outlook for this thesis. So first of all, the introduction. Here we will talk about the systems and effects that are most important to this thesis. And first of all, the most important system are quantum dots. Because they appear throughout all the theses. They appear in all the chapters of the thesis. And quantum dots are confined systems where you trap the motion of electrons in all three dimensions. So they become zero dimensional systems. And thanks to this trapping, you have that electrons in these systems have discrete energy levels. That's why many people call them artificial atoms. And the thing is that the advantage with these systems is that you can control the energy levels of the system by a gate control. And also, you can study transport through them when you connect them to reservoirs and you produce a single electron transistor like this, or like this here. It's important to know also that in quantum dots you can have charging effects, which can become important when the dot is not very strongly coupled to the reservoirs or it's when it's small. And the char these charging effects can have as a consequence that transport through the system is blocked. So, for example, here, when you have an electron inside this quantum dot with this discrete energy levels, an electron from a reservoir can hop in if the interaction between the two electrons is not very strong. And so transport can happen. But instead, if the repulsion between these electrons is very strong, the second electron cannot enter, and so transport is blocked. And that's why it's called Coulomb blockade, because it's a, a blockade of transport mediated because of the interaction between electrons. Another very important effect that we find in, uh, that we use in our system, in our thesis, is the quantum Hall effect, which is caused in a two-dimensional electron gas with a very strong perpendicular magnetic field. And in this case, what happens is that the electrons in the bulk have uh, orbits that make them uh, insulating. But still you can have transport through the edges of this sample. And what happens here is that the transport through the edges is chiral because it transports in one direction through one edge and the opposite direction in the other edge. Also very importantly in this kind of system because of these skipping orbits you have no backscattering. And this is the main feature that we're going to use about this quantum Hall effect. The fact that it has chiral edge states with no backscattering. Also, it's very important to talk about thermoelectricity. As you have seen in the title, it's about charge and energy transport. And the interplay of the two is called thermoelectricity. And thermoelectricity means two things. That you can create a charge current by applying a temperature gradient, which would be rem reminiscent of the Seebeck effect. Or uh, you can create a heat current by applying a voltage bias, which would be reminiscent of the Peltier effect. It's important to know that quantum effects, it, it's said that they can improve efficiency of such systems. And also, understanding the dissipation of heat can be very important in modern transistors, since they can help uh, enhance battery life, for example, in devices, or lead us to improved solar panels. On top of that, we also uh, studied environments. In this case, we know that our 
the systems that we are studying, they are not isolated in the world. They are surrounded by a circuit. And what we do is we model this circuit that surrounds our system as an environment. And in this case, we have that there is a possibility of a change in energy with the environment, but never particles. And we know that this exchange of energy then causes inelasticities in transport, which one might think that are negative, but they can also be positive since they can promote transport. Also, since this is a circuit that it's man-made, we can engineer it. So we can have that the environment is not only something that it's, it's given to us, but something that we can engineer and it can be smart, as we will see further on. So now we move to the results. First of all, we will talk about interference and two particle effects in a Maxender interferometer fed by single particle sources. And the goal of this work was to see how the charge and energy in such a system have an interplay since it's known that in two single particle sources in series they have very different behaviors and also to gain insight on the behavior of the charge in such a system since it has a particular behavior. So first of all we will introduce the system which is formed by two parts, an electronic mass sender interferometer and then the single particle sources that we use to fit it. And then we will move to uh, a simpler case of a max sender fed by only one single particle source to understand how this system works. And then we'll move to the full result with the max sender fed by two single particle sources. And we will study the system through spectral charge and energy currents. And finally, we'll move to brief conclusions and outlook for this work. So first of all, is the max sender interferometer. It's built in a quantum hall uh, system and is the electronic equivalent of the optic max sender interferometer where two quantum point contacts act as mirrors and the quantum hall edge states act as arms of the interferometer. Also since we are in the quantum hall uh, regime we have that this encloses a magnetic flux and this has as a consequence that when we apply a, a voltage between the input and the output, we have that the charge current has oscillations both with the magnetic field and with the detuning of the two arms of the interferometer. The other ingredient of the system are single particle sources, which are built using a quantum capacitor. In this case, it's just a quantum dot attached to one reservoir. And the quantum dot is made by trapping a quantum hole edge state through a quantum point contact. And in this case, we have that we control them by a voltage gate, time dependent uh, voltage. And then in this case, we have that the, the quantum dot is full with electrons. And then when you push the voltage up, it can emit one electron, and when you take it down again, uh, one hole is emitted or one electron is absorbed again in the, in the quantum point contact. So you have that in one period, you have emitted one electron and one hole in a controlled way. So now we move to the <coughs> first part where we use a, uh, one of these sources to feed a uh, a single elect uh, a max sender interferometer and we measure the output at uh, at four so first of all we study the spectral current obtained with the scattered matrix approach and what we find is that in the spectral current which is the energy resolved charge current we find that we have oscillations with the magnetic field and also a decay of these oscillations with the energy when the two arms of the interferometer are equal. But when the two arms are different, we find that we also have oscillations in the energy that are also exponentially decaying. And this has as a consequence then that in the charge and energy currents, which can be obtained from this spectral current, we find oscillations with the magnetic field. And now these oscillations decay over the, uh, with the detuning of the two arms on a scale given by the length of the uh, emitted electrons. And so we can interpret these results in two ways. We can think of them as 
So if you detune the two arms for longer than the length of the emitted electrons, then the two electrons will not see each other, or the electron that goes pro through the upper arm and the lower arm will not see each other, and then the interference is um, going down. But also you can interpret it just from looking at these integrals. So from the spectral current, since we have here oscillations, this means that for the detuning, you will have less and less oscillations all the time when you in integrate over energy. So we have two interpretations, a particle-based interpretation and a wave-based interpretation. So now we move to the results with two sources. So now we have electrons from source A, which can interfere, and then electrons from source B, which cannot interfere, but they can interplay with electrons from source A. So for example, if we emit an electron from source A, this one can be absorbed in source B, if you tune it so that it emits holes. And also, electrons from A can uh, collide with electrons from B at the, where the interference happens. So first of all, we look at the case of absorption. And what we find is that when the two, the two sources are tuned so that an absorption can happen, the oscillations with the magnetic field disappear in the spectral current. And the oscillations also disappear in the charge and energy current. Again, we can give two interpretations to this. If, if, the, if the spectral current has no oscillations, obviously, after integrating, the charge and energy current will also have no no oscillations. And on the other hand, with the particle interpretation, we know that if the electron from A takes the lower path, it will be absorbed. So then we can know which path it took. So there cannot be interference because we can know the path of the, of the electron. On the other hand, if we look at the case of collisions, we find that the behavior is rather different. And in this case, we have that the spectral current still has oscillations. And uh, so we move now to the charge and energy currents. And we find that the charge current has no oscillations. And yet, the energy current has oscillations. So now we, have a, the, we can start to try to interpret the results. And if we try to interpret the results of the charge current, we can think again that the electrons can collide at the, at the final quantum point contact. And then if they collide, they, for poly exclusion, they have to go to different outputs. So if they go to different outputs, you have no fluctuation of the charge in either of the outputs. So you know which path it took. And again, you can see that the charge is, uh, has no oscillations. But then if you move to the energy current, you find that it still has oscillation. So this interpretation breaks down in this case. And we can only use the interpretation on the, the wave interpretation. Because if you integrate this over energy, you find it, that it gives a zero. But if you weigh it with an energy factor, which is which what gives you here in the uh, energy current, this does not happen. So we have only one interpretation viable in this case. So in conclusion, we have studied the Maxender interferometer fed either by one or two sources. We have found that in when only one source is applied, all quantities have magnetic oscillations. But when two sources are applied, we have two different scenarios, absorption or collision. And we have that an absorption uh, suppresses the interference everywhere. But in the case of the collision, only on the charge current. We have given different explanations give, uh, based on particle or wave nature of the particles injected. And we have seen that they do not always work. So the outlook would be now to study the heat correlation, since we studied the charge correlations in the written thesis. And they didn't give us much insight. Maybe move to different type of sources, for example, levitons. And as a final step, consider a different model instead of the scattering matrix to be able to consider interactions in such a system. Now we move to the second work, which is time-dependent heat flow in interacting quantum conductors. And our goal here was to study if a result found for non-interacting quantum conductors, where you have to take into account 
the heat dissipated at the barriers does apply to also interacting systems. And also to see if the quantization of the charge relaxation resistance applies to the thermoelectric counterparts. So first of all, we will introduce the system, which we have already kind of seen, which is a quantum capacitor. And then we will move to the Hamiltonian description that we use to describe such a system. And then we will move to the expressions, the general expressions for the heat currents from this Hamiltonian. And then we will show our uh, results for the heat currents for such a system. And then we will move to the admittances. And then we will apply these theoretical results to a multi-orbital system and move <coughs> to conclusions and outlook. So first of all, quantum capacitor. It's just a quantum dot attached to one reservoir where the, the quantum dot is also capacitively coupled to a gate. So the gate acts as one of the plates of the capacitor and the quantum dot acts as the other. And they can store charge here, just like in a classical capacitor. And in this case, we have that we have a, a, a voltage driving, a time-dependent voltage driving. And we can show that applying it on the gate or on the reservoir, it's interchangeable situations as long as you consider an internal potential in the quantum dot. We also divide this type of system in three parts. A part of the reservoir, a part for the uh, tunneling, and a part for the quantum dot. And now we move to the Hamiltonian description, where we <coughs> describe the system in three parts, reservoir, tunneling, and dot. And the part for the reservoir is just simply the energy of the particles in the reservoir, plus the possible driving that we have there. Then we have the tunneling part, which on only takes into account the exchange of particles between the dot and the reservoir. And finally, the Hamiltonian of the dot, which is given just by one energy, and in this case, this energy is given by the defined energy of the quantum dot plus the internal potential due to the driving. And also we have uh, interaction terms, in this case, in the Hartree-Fock approximation. So now we move to the heat currents. From the Hamiltonian, we know that the heat currents in each of the three parts is given just by the time derivative of the Hamiltonian, which can also be written like this which now moves us to here, where we can just see that because the Hamiltonian commutes with itself, we have uh, heat conservation or energy conservation. And so since we have this conservation, we can uh, write one of the three heat currents in terms of the other two. And the other two we can obtain just from the Green's function of the quantum dot. It's just which gives us the, the occupation of the quantum dot. So the time derivative of the occupation times the, the energy is the heat current in the quantum dot. And the heat current in the tunneling is given by the mixed Green's function of dot and reservoir. So after some algebra, we're able to express these heat currents in terms only of the Green's functions of the dot. And we obtain these two different expressions in the linear regime. For any, um, for any frequency of the, of the applied voltage. And the, th the thing here is that in the non-interacting case, they tell us that for these heat currents to be correct, we need to redefine them. So we need to have the heat current at the reservoir, which is the heat current at the reservoir that we obtain, plus one half of the one that you obtain for the tunneling and the same for the one in the quantum dot. Otherwise, your heat currents are ill-defined. And in this case, if we apply this, we find that these heat currents are now given by this expression. And again, the heat current conservation is fulfilled. From these expressions, now we, we can obtain the admittances. First of all, we can obtain the charge admittance which was obtained previously. And from these admittance, we can also obtain the capacitance and the charge relaxation resistance. And similarly, for the heat current, we can also obtain the thermoelectric admittances and the respective capacitance and uh, resistance. 
we apply these results that we obtain to a multi-orbital uh, conductor, in this case a quantum dot in a carbon nanotube. So we chose a carbon nanotube because it's a well-known system and it has a lot of different interactions. In this case we have a Zeeman splitting but also orbit coupling, also spin orbit coupling and on top of that we have the interaction between electrons that can hop into this system. So first of all what we do is we check through the admittances that the symmetries from the energy current that we obtained are correct and to see that these are correct we know that in the linear regime we need that the real part is symmetric and the imaginary part is anti-symmetric and we find that for the charge this is indeed like this and for the thermoelectric counterpart indeed we have the same this function is symmetric and this one is anti-symmetric so we check that the Indeed, we need to take into account this heat dissipated at the tunneling barriers. On top of that, since we did not restrict ourselves to any frequencies, we, have, we find that at multiples of the driving frequency, we have uh, some different features with our sig signatures of photosystem transport. And then we move to the capacitances and resistance. In this case, we find that all capacitances and resistance have different peaks at the resonances of the quantum dot and we find that the, the well it was found that the resistance for the charge relaxation resistance is quantized if you see it goes between one quarter and one half of h over e square but this is not the case for the thermoelectric counterpart what we find also is that while the, the electrical magnitudes are always positive, the thermoelectric uh, responses are not always positive, which means that the energy response to a voltage bias can be either uh, delayed or advanced to the appliance of the bias. Still, the, the RC time defined by the product of these two quantities is always positive, both for the electrical case and the thermoelectric case. So in conclusion, we developed a theoretical frame for interacting quantum RC circuits. We found an expression for the heat current in the lead and the dot. We have found that heat in the stored in the barriers has to be taken into account. And we have checked that this is indeed the case by applying it to a multi-orbital conductor and uh, studying the admittances and the RC parameters. We have also done it with, for a single orbital system, which is in the written thesis. As an outlook, it would be interesting to consider a temperature driving so we can complete the on sagar matrix for this system. And also, a study a more complete interaction model where we no, do not restrict ourselves to the Hartree-Fock approximation. And probably adding a second reservoir to the system will uh, give us also a much insight to these results. So now we move to the third chapter which is dynamical Coulomb blockade of thermal transport and in this case the goal of this work was to study how an environment affects transport through a single electron transistor. So first of all we will start with the model again the quantum dot in the environment then the, 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 the master equation that we use to describe it and then we will move to the P of E theory that allows us to model the environment then we will talk about the quantities that we obtain in the linear regime through the Onsager matrix. And then we will move to the results of Seebeck and thermal asymmetry and the thermoelectric performance of the system. And finally, we will move to conclusions and outlook for this work. So first of all, we have our system here, which is two reservoirs with a quantum dot. And and the thing here is now that we have an environment. So the circuit surrounding this thing is modeled as an impedance that is acting as the environment. And in this case, what happens is that when, when electron transition happens from the reservoir to the quantum dot, <coughs> there can be absorption and emission of energy. In this case, we take into account that electrons in the quantum dot can be capacitively coupled to the electrons in the reservoir. So through this electrostatic model, we model this capacitance. So we have that the energy in the dot is not only the one just defined in the dot, it's also taking 
into account how many electrons there are in, in the dot before hopping, and also this capacity field coupling to the different reservoirs, with this K uh, factor giving the asymmetry of the capacitances. So now we move to the description. We have that in our system there is a strong interaction, so we are in the Coulomb blockade regime, and when you are in the Coulomb blockade regime, as the states in the quantum dot are very well quantized, so you have that uh, hopping happens one by one, so you have sequential transport. And in this case, it's very easy to describe the system through a master equation. The master equation characterizes the different states of the quantum dot, so zero but for empty dot, sigma for either up or down spin electron, and two for doubly occupied quantum dot. And you just classify this through the probabilities of occupation, and in this case, you describe the change in probability through some tunneling rates that change the state of the system. And to ensure that the system is correct, you have to normalize the probabilities. In a very similar way, you can calculate the current, so just taking into account the possible states and how many electrons go in and out of the system, you obtain the charge current. And very similarly, you can obtain the heat current by weighing with an energy factor. So in this case, what one usually does is it obtains, you obtain the tunneling rates through Fermi's golden rule, which uh, relates this transition between states uh, with probabilities of occupation in both the initial and final state of the system. So you have that electrons in the, the reservoir are described with a Fermi function, and the ones in the quantum dot are described by a delta function because the states are very well quantized. And similar for the energy, where you add an uh, energy factor into this integral. But what we want to do is to go a step further, and now these tunneling rates have to take into account that you have an environment. And to take into account this environment, what you do is you add uh, a P of E function. So you, you change the delta function of the dot for a probability function that takes into account the possibility of emitting and absorbing, absorbing energy when a transition happens. This P of E function, what it does, it models the environment as an impedance, as we have said before, and it accounts for voltage fluctuations in, in this type of circuit. So when an electron jumps a barrier, modeled here as a resistance and capacitance in parallel, you have voltage fluctuations. And if you account for these voltage fluctuations, you are able to take into account the effect of the environment. In this case, the P of E function takes into account these fluctuations by studying the voltage correlations given by this J function. Usually, quantum dot circuits are embedded in a circuit that has a high impedance. And when you have a high impedance, you find that the, in a high impedance environment, this P of E function is just a Gaussian function with different probabilities of absorbing and emitting energies. And the main characteristics of this Gaussian function, which are the width and the energy position, are controlled by the asymmetry of the capacitances in the two contacts. Now that we have all the ingredients, we can calculate both charge and energy current, and in the linear regime, we can relate them to the applied voltage and thermal gradients through the Onsager matrix. In this case, the Onsager matrix, what tells us is that there are symmetry relations for these conductances due to microreversibility. And we have checked that when you have an environment, these symmetry relations are fulfilled. But in such a system, if there were no interactions, you would have other symmetries coming from the unitarity of the scattering matrix. And in this case, these other symmetries are not necessarily fulfilled when you take into account an environment. And in this case, we look at the, at the symmetries in the thermal part only in the L and K coefficients. So the electrothermal and thermal coefficients. If we look first at the electrothermal coefficient, we find that indeed, when the capacitances are not symmetric, uh, 
we find an asymmetry for these two coefficients. And it changes sign both with the asymmetry and with the energy level of the system. Because the energy can be either positive or negative, when you shift through the, this energy level, you find this so to a, st a structure. And we find also that when the coupling is stronger, which means that the, the coupling to the environment is also stronger, we find that we have a stronger asymmetry in this system. But we find that in this case, we have no tunnel barrier. So if the tunneling barriers are asymmetric, we have no asymmetry in this quantity. Instead, if we look at the thermal asymmetry, we find that in this case, again, we have an asymmetry when the capacitance is changed. And what we find here is that when we increase the capacitance, instead of being enhanced, it has a very different behavior. It actually changes sign. But the thing is that this sign change is not due to the fact, it's due to the fact that there are two different contributions. One due to the different capacitances and one due to the different barriers. And in this case, what happens is that the weight of the two different contribution changes and that's why we have a, a sign change in this case. This means also that there can be a heat rectification in the linear regime. Now if we look at uh, different uh, barriers, we find also that there's a thermal asymmetry, which did not happen for the thermoelectric counterpart. And we find that in this case, even for asymmetric capacitances, we can have asymmetry and also um, thermal rectification. Now we move to the case of the efficiency and power, in, in this case we know that uh, any thermoelectric uh, device can be used as an engine just by applying a voltage bias and a thermal gradient in the opposite direction you are able to push a current against the bias which is the definition of a thermoelectric engine and in this case if we do so we can look at the effects of the environment on the performance of, of such a setup and we see that uh, in this case we find that the, in the efficiency can be enhanced because of the environment and also the power can be enhanced because of the environment. Because the environment can inject heat into the system. In this case we find that with a strong coupling we have an efficiency higher than the theoretical limit in the linear regime, which is the curzon alborn limit. In this case one half of the Carnot efficiency. We find that this is possible but always at vanishing power output so it's not of much use. Yet we can find the reasonable efficiency of one third of the Carnot efficiency for maximum power output. So in conclusion we have studied inelastic effects on thermoelectric transport. We have seen that the environment can promote heat transport and cause heat rectification. We have seen that some symmetries are not fulfilled anymore when you consider an environment. And, and also that the asymmetric couplings can enhance the efficiency of such a system. The outlook for this work would be now to consider different environments. We have only studied one case, the high impedance case, but maybe we could study also other cases like low impedance, for example. Uh, since having multiple quantum dots in series enhances the performance of, uh, of a thermoelectric engine, we could consider that also with the environment. Now, as we have seen, coupling a strong, uh, having a stronger coupling to the environment enhances the efficiency. So maybe we could move to a strongly coupled systems to go further in these directions. And this would mean also that probably we'll have to take into account a coherent system. Finally, we move to the last results chapter, and in this case it's the Carroll Maxwell Demon in a quantum hole setup. Our goal here was to expand the very literature investigation that's been done on Maxwell Demons profiting from quantum effects, and also to see if the breaking of the local detailed balance condition in a quantum hole setup can be profited to implement a Maxwell Demon.
So first of all, I will introduce the classical Maxwell daemon, and then the device that we use to implement this daemon, and the master equation that we use to describe such a system. Then I will tell you how to use this daemon as an engine, and we will characterize it through charge, energy, and information currents. And then we will try to use the, the same device to use the daemon as a refrigerator, and we will characterize it through energy and information currents. Finally, we'll move to conclusions and outlook. So first of all, the classical Maxwell demon or original Maxwell demon is just a being that controls a frictionless door that's between two chambers of the same equilibrium gas. And this demon is very smart and it can separate hot and cold particles in this system without spending energy, any energy. So after some iterations, it's able to separate uh, the cold particles and the hot particles. So now we have a hot, uh, hot gas and a cold gas, so we are able to extract work from this. So in the end, what we have done is extracting work from an equilibrium gas, which is in contradiction with the second law of thermodynamics. This paradox is resolved from the fact that this demon needs to extract information from the system. And to uh, extract this information, it needs to store this information and be able to erase it every time it repeats the, uh, these steps. So this is what resolves this paradox, this apparent paradox. So our goal now is to use a quantum system, in this case, a quantum dot or localized impurity in a quantum hole bar. So you see here the chiral edge states connecting the two different reservoirs. And you can see that you have capacitive coupling between the electrons in the quantum dot and the electrons occupying the different chiral edge states. And in this case, when you reverse the magnetic field, of course, the chirality of the edge state changes. And this implies that the energy levels inside the quantum dot change when you, you change the magnetic field. And they change in such a way that it's depending on the asymmetry of the capacitances and the applied voltage. It has been shown that when you do this, uh, you break the local detailed balance condition in such a system. And this breaking of this condition is a, a required condition to apply a Maxwell demon. So we investigate if this is the case or not. So if we wanted to implement the demon as, a, as an engine, what we would do is now we want to take a current against the bias, much as in the other case with the, where you would use a thermal gradient. Now we use the information. And the, with four steps, we're able to do so. First of all, what you do is you wait for an electron to go from the right reservoir inside the dot. And then the demon is able to act. What it does, it reverses the magnetic field. So the energy of the, of the electron inside the quantum dot changes, pushing it up. So now it's easier for it to, uh, again, jump against the bias. And when this happens, the demon detects it again and lowers the energy of the quantum dot by changing the magnetic field. So in four steps, we have been able to push one electron against a current without having any thermal gradient applied. To study this system, again, we are in the coulomb broca regime, so we have sequential transport, so we can use a master equation. Again, we characterize it through the occupation probabilities. And in this case, we have only two possible states, either empty or filled. And we have the different transition rates for for these two states. The thing now is that we have to take into account that there's a demon acting on this system. So what we do is take into account that rates in are always at positive magnetic fields and that rate out are always at negative magnetic field. And we do so by taking into account that now the energies in the Fermi functions are either plus for positive magnetic field or minus for negative magnetic field. And also we have to take into account that possible barriers are different when the, state, when the quantum dot is empty and when it's full. So we see now that, the, of course, 
In this case, the demon needs to favor certain transitions. Not all transitions in the system have to be of the same probability. So we need uh, energy dependent barriers in the system. And to have energy dependence, the easiest way is to use a WKB approximation, which tells us that the tunneling rates are now energy dependent. And the probability of tun tunneling is exponentially decaying from the top energy of the barrier. So we have that now tunneling rates depend on energy, and that means that they depend on the chirality of the edge states through the magnetic field. So now let's see if this works as a demo. So let's look at the effect of feedback on the charge current. So first of all, if we have that the two barriers are equal, we find that the charge current just follows the, the bias that we applied, as one would expect. But when the barriers are different, the demon is able to act. And for a strong enough uh, symmetry of the capacitances, the current, instead of following the bias, it goes against the bias. So we find that, indeed, we have a working engine without any applied thermal gradient. OK, but one can say now, well, you are injecting energy to the system. So where's the, where's the fun in that? So if we look at the energy that is injected by the demon, we find that it's the same in both cases, almost the same in both cases. So in, we think that this is not the main mechanism driving the current against the bias. If the energy current in one case is the same as in the other, and in this case nothing was happening, and in this case something is happening, means that there is a different mechanism be behind all of this. So now what we look at is the information current, which we obtain from the balance of entropies in such a system. And what we see here is that in the case where the barriers are equal, there is basically no information current obtained by the Maxwell demon. But instead, when the barriers are different, the demon is able to extract information from the system. And as soon as it's able to extract information from the system, it's able to push the current against the bias. So it's working as a demon because it's working through the information. Although it's not an ideal demon because it it's needs to inject energy to perform. Now we move to the second possibility. Now what we like to do is to implement a cooling process with the demon. So now what we do is we apply a thermal gradient and we would like to extract energy from the cold reservoir through information only. Unfortunately, in this case, the demon does not work unless we have an applied uh, voltage bias because otherwise there is no difference in the energies of the quantum dot. So we need a small applied voltage bias for the demon to perform. And in this case, the four steps are very similar. We just have to take a high energy electron from the right and push it to the left. If we do so, we can look now at the energy current that is being extracted from the cold reservoir. And we see that uh, in both cases, we have extraction of energy from the cold reservoir. So the cooling process is working. But funnily enough, asymmetric barriers uh, have no notable effect on this. So let's look at the energy current that the demon is extracting from the system. And in this case, we find that the demon is extracting a lot of energy, which can actually account for all the cooling that is happening in the system. So in this case, we seem to find that the heat that is being extracted by the demon is all that is needed to explain this behavior. And if we look at the information current, we see now that, first of all, the demon is not acting properly, since in this case it's actually injecting information to the system, so it's increasing its entropy, it's not doing anything. And in the case of asymmetric barriers, it's actually able to help a little bit in the cooling process. Now, we can see here that the energy that is extracted in this case is smaller than in this case. And despite the cooling being the same, so we see that it actually helps a little bit. But it's actually not working as we want it. It's not mainly information power, but energy power. So in conclusion, we have studied uh, Maxwell demon in a quantum hall system. We have seen that chirality plays a crucial role. And then we have seen that the demon is able to push a current against a voltage bias. And it 
that we need both asymmetric capacitances and asymmetric barriers to do so. We have seen that the demon is not ideal because not, it not only needs to extract information, but also needs to inject heat into the system. And we have seen that the demon produces cooling, by, but by extracting heat. So it's not a demon-like process because it's not using information to do so. The outlook to this work would be now to study a Maxwell demon in a quantum spin hole setup instead of a quantum hole setup to avoid switching the magnetic field, which can be energy costly and actually defeat the purpose of the demon. Also, since we are using it as an engine, try to characterize the power and efficiency of such a system. And finally, consider not only sequential tunneling, but also coherent tunneling and see how this affects the performance of the demon. So now, in conclusion for the whole thesis, we have studied different techniques, scattering matrix, non-equilibrium Green's functions, and master equation, both with an environment and with feedback, to study thermoelectric transport through different devices. We have seen that interference and collisions reveal the different nature of both of energy and charge. We have seen that the heat stored in the barriers has to be taken into account in interacting time-dependent systems. We have also seen that an environment can enhance the performance of a single electron transistor and also produce heat rectification in the linear regime. We have seen that chirality can be used to implement a Maxwell demon. And as different outlooks, we have that we could investigate the energy current correlations in the first work, also probably consider a temperature driving in the second work, and study different environments and add coherent processes to the demo. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. I just realized I forgot to introduce the supervisor during my presentation. I mean, the introduction, right? This is also, you also need this. Okay, so now let's have a three minutes break for the ones who want to stretch their legs. And then we meet here again, and then we continue with the questions. <laughs> Vale, no nos quedamos en preguntas. Claro que vos puedo quedar. Ah. Yeah.